Grenade by Alan Gratz, part one, pages 44 through 50. Hideki, Mabui. Hideki's hands were so sweaty, he worried the grenade he held would slip right out of his grasp. He wiped a hand on his jacket and nodded to Katsumasa, who was a few yards to his left. All the boys were hiding behind whatever bushes and tree trunks hadn't been destroyed by the offshore bombardment. As a group, they crept forward, drawing closer to where they had heard someone crashing through the undergrowth. Hideki strained to catch every sound, every movement. Yoshio waved for everyone to stop, and then Hideki heard it. The crunch and snap of heavy footfalls on the forest floor. Someone was coming. The footsteps got louder, more urgent, and Hideki heard a man's breath. This is it, he thought. This is my moment of glory. But Hideki didn't feel glorious. His stomach was tied up in knots and he could barely breathe. He wasn't even sure he could stand. One of the boys jumped out from where he was hiding and yelled, Banzai! And more of them did the same. Hideki borrowed some of their courage and leaped to his feet, ready to strike the fuse on his grenade and throw it at an American soldier. But it wasn't an American soldier. Huffing along the trail was Norio Kojima, their school principal. The portly man's uniform was muddy and torn, and he hugged a tall canvas sack to his chest. Principal Kojima cried out in surprise as the boys all popped up screaming and brandishing grenades, and he tripped over his own feet and fell to the ground. The sack broke his fall, but something inside it shattered and snapped. Framed pictures spilled out onto the forest floor. No! No! the principal cried. Principal Kojima? Hideki said. Luckily, none of the boys had activated their grenades, and now they all hurried to help their principal to his feet. The emperor! The pictures of the emperor! Kojima said. Some of them have been damaged. Hideki picked up one of the framed photographs that was still intact. It was a picture of Emperor Hirohito. A portrait of the emperor hung in every room at school. Hideki and the other boys had to bow to the picture and the Japanese flag every time they came or went. Principal Kojima must have collected every one of the portraits and stuffed them into the sack. Principal Kojima scrambled to collect the other pictures. It is my sacred duty to protect the divine emperor's photographs, he said. I'm taking these north to the Imperial Photograph Guardian Unit. The Emperor's spirit must be protected. Hideki had never seen Principal Kojima so frantic, and it scared him a little. He could tell the other boys were frightened too, but Hideki understood the principal's concern. A person's spirit, what the Okinawans called Mabue, was like his soul. It's what made you who you were. Everybody had a Mabui, including Hideki. Mabui was immortal and transferable. A ring you inherited from your grandmother might have her Mabui in it. A watch your father had owned might still carry his Mabui. You could even lose your Mabui if you weren't careful. And pictures, whether they were drawings or photographs like these of the Emperor Hirohito, they carried part of a person's Mabui in them too. So it was like each of these photos was a little piece of the Emperor's soul. It was the Mabui of Hideki's cowardly ancestor, Shigetomo Kaneshiro, that still cursed every third generation of Hideki's family. Hideki, uh, Hideki's own Mabui shared space inside him with the spirit of Shigetomo. As long as Shigetomo's spirit was still restless, Hideki would never know peace and could never truly be himself. Hideki's sister had tried to help him with Shigetomo's Mabui in her official role as a yuta, but... Kimiko had always had more success with other people. Once, Hideki remembered, he had gone with her on a house call to a family with a young boy who kept getting in trouble at school. That day, Kimiko had worn a white bashufu, a lightweight banana fiber kimono that matched the streak in her hair. Shinsai keeps getting into fights, the boy's mother had complained. I have to bring him home at least once a week. His older brother, Ichiro, never got into trouble like this. Shinsei was a scruffy, sh surly boy of seven with a thin trickle of snout running down his dirty face. Hideki thought he looked like trouble, but Kimiko smiled at the boy and talked to him like an adult. Have you been ba having bad dreams, Shinsei? She asked him. 
Shinsei frowned and looked away. In the next room, a baby cried, and Shinsei's mother got up to see it. Shinsei? Kimiko tried again. Yes, the boy grunted. A female wolf comes and chases me out of the house and won't let me back in. I think I understand, Kimiko said. You do? Shinsei asked. You do? Hideki asked. He was confused. None of it made any sense to him. The wolf in Jensei's dream represents a female ancestor born in the year of the dog, Kimiko explained. When Shinsei's mother came back, Kimiko asked her, asked her if there was someone matching that description who had been a troublemaker in the past. Yes, my Aunt Toshi, the mother said. My mother's middle sister. She was always running around with boys my grandfather didn't like. Oh, the fights they would have. Kimiko nodded. Shinsei has his great aunt Toshi's mabui on him. She's still acting out through him. Go once a week to the family tomb where she is buried, just the two of you, and perform the ceremony I teach you. You got all that from his dream about a wolf? Hideki asked later as he and Kimiko walked home. Kimiko grinned. Well, not all of it. Being a yeta is about listening to our ancestors, but it's about paying attention to the living, too. Did you hear the cries from the other room? There's a new baby in the house, and his mother mentioned an older brother, which makes Shinsei the middle child. The oldest brother has all the responsibility, and the baby gets all the mother's attention. Shinsei doesn't have a role in the family anymore, so he acts out to get any kind of attention, even if it's negative attention. He probably doesn't even know he's doing it. But now he and his mother will spend time together once a week, walking back and forth to the family tomb to perform a ceremony together, and Shinsei will get lots of attention without having to get into trouble. So, all that about his great aunt Toshi, you just made that up, Hideki asked. Kimiko smacked him on the head. No, her mabui really is on him. She was a middle child too, didn't you hear? She probably went through the same thing, only there was no Yota to send her on long walks to the family tomb with her mother, so she never got over it. Kimiko's voice grew quiet. I hope Shinsei's trips to the family tomb with his mother will bring both him and his great aunt Toshi peace in the end. Hideki still had trouble understanding it all, but his sister seemed to know what she was talking about. I'm a middle child too, and I never acted like that, he said at last. That's because you have a different Mabui to worry about, Kimiko told him. One Hideki would have to wait a little longer to appease. I've got to get these pictures to safety, Principal Kijima, Kijima was saying now. Hideki watched as he stuffed the last of the Emperor's portraits back in the bag and stood up. Remember to fight and die for your country with honor. We'll meet again in the afterlife, he told his former students and ran off. The boys were debating whether to return to the cave or to keep looking for American soldiers when Yoshio perked up. Do you smell that? He whispered. A delicious aroma tickled Hideki's nose, and he turned into the wind and sniffed. Somebody nearby was cooking something over a campfire. Something good. Hideki hadn't eaten meat in ages. All the meat in Okinawa now went to the Japanese soldiers, and his mouth watered at the tasty smell. Some of the other boys had picked up on it, too, and they smiled at each other. Hideki's stomach growled eagerly, but he didn't smile. The smell of roasting meat could mean only one thing. Americans, he whispered.